Hi, I'm Sarah O'Connell and I'm the facilitator of the North Canterbury Farming for Profit program. We are working through a webinar series on working dogs uh, and we are doing this with Laurie Linney from Vet Life and, and the Teammate project that she has been working on for a number of years. So we're about to have a bit of a look at feeding a dog and what are the requirements around feeding the different dogs that you might have in your team and what are some of the best things to be feeding them. So Laurie, take it away. Radio. So there we go. Um, this question is something that everybody likes to ask. What's the best food to feed my dog, my working dogs, my specific working dog? So, um, you know, they're not, they're not your basic Labrador. They're, they're, um, I, I call and treat all working dogs as athletes. They, most of those, or many of those dogs go out there and run easy half marathon to um, marathon a day, um, especially some of these skinny little whippity hitting dogs that, um, that do some high country mustering. So the question from people ask me, what's the best food? And the first thing I ask them is which dog and what kind of work are they doing? So if you look at those dogs in that wagon there, there's a great big, so this old Huntway over here would probably eat about half as much as this Weasley little heading dog over here. Your beardy in the middle, they tend to be a little bit more energy um, requiring. And this guy here looks like he doesn't miss too many meals actually. He's got a pretty decent fat cover. So look, can you feed it? I mean, what's the best food? Every, it's different for every dog. Um, I had a Jack Russell and a um, Australian Shepherd and they both ate the same amount of the same food and I struggled to keep weight on the Jack Russell and the Australian Shepherd was a fat little chart. So you, you know, their um, energy requirements and metabolism are all different. So you just have to get to know your dogs um, and Importantly, like any other kind of feeding and feed management is learn how to do body condition scoring on dogs. So we used a body condition scoring system in the, um, in the working dog study that was from Wasaba. So that's the World Small Animal Veterinary Association. And that's uh, one to nine. I apologize for the size of the writing. Um, you should be able to to um, blow that up. If you can't, you can certainly Google that Wasaba body condition scoring chart um, and it will come up in a lot bolder, brighter words than that. But basically, um, they call a five an ideal. I, I actually don't think that's good for most pets and I certainly don't think it's good for, for working dogs because most of our working dogs will lie, I think our average score was four and it certainly ranged anywhere from two to seven. Um, you do have to be a little bit careful when you look at a dog that looks like this. I, you know, sometimes you'll see some uber fit um, and heading dogs that have done a good solid week of mustering and they look like that, but their um, coats look like this joker over here and they are absolutely, you know, they're jumping out of their skin, fit as a buck rat, but they're skinny really skinny. I mean, how many of those, those um, old 40 year old guys on, on um, road bikes do you see nowadays that, that, that don't look a bit crusty? And that's because they're very, very lean. So you need to be really careful when you're looking at body condition scores that you, you take into consideration what your lean body mass is as well. So basically what you're doing is you're checking out uh, pin bones in here, waist, it's nice arch, um, and fat covering along the ribs, just like, uh, you know, just like doing fat lambs, right? When a dog's standing up, you run your hand along their ribs and you should be able to feel, um, you know, I always tell people you compare it to your hand. This is too fat. This is too skinny. In here is about right where you run your finger over that, this part of your um, hand and you feel fat over each rib, but you still drop down in between. And again, um, working dogs will be a little bit more to the skinny side of that uh, if they're in full work. Now this guy over here, um, if, you, if you look at his, so I think down in three, three talks about ribs easily palpated, his certainly are, um, and maybe um, visible, but with no palpable fat. So you can run your hand over his ribs and you can't feel the hang of a lot of fat over his ribs. 
The tops of the lumbar vertebrae are visible and the pelvic bones are becoming prominent. So that's those pin bones out the back and in, um, in behind there. So um, he's got an obvious waist and abdominal tuck. So this dog is about a three. And I think this dog's in fabulous condition. I mean, look at the, he's got an outstanding coat um, and certainly a three in a lot of people's books is um, too skinny, but I, I think in a working dog that that's, you've got to take a lot of things in a, in, into consideration. Um, that, like I said, a dog with a coat like that, um, that's, that's working and having no problems, I think that's where you should be. Three or four, um, certainly you get up into the fives, Sixes and the sevens are just just too overweight, and that's really hard when you're. Um, well, it's no different than us when you, you let them sit around for a little while, and then you ask them to go catch you. And man, that's hard going, and that's certainly where we end up see with a lot of our injuries is animals that aren't aren't fit for work. Um, so, I think that's worth becoming familiar with to get. Um, and that's what you need to feed your dog to, and it will vary from dog to dog. So. The present situation and certainly what we found on the teammate project was uh, we, most people are feeding once, once a day. Thank goodness, um, not every, they used to feed only on days that they worked or every other day. And thankfully that that's, that's not, a, that's basically a thing of the past. Um, dogs, I think, do need fed every day. Maybe they don't need to be fed as much every day if they're not doing a huge amount, but, but once daily feeding, I think is, is minimal. So um, types of foods fed, most people still feed meat, um, or like home kill or, or purchased meat um, that's suitably frozen, to, uh, minimum 10 degrees for 10 days. Um, for shape measles, then of course the dry foods, this is the marketer's dream, dry foods. Come back to that. Wet foods, we're looking at dog rolls, um, there's um, a few Preparations now that are basically some form of, of fat with a mix of some type of protein, be that meat or awful, um, usually off-cut stuff from processing food. Now, there's still some people that feed awful um, if it's processed properly, um, so it needs to be well, well cooked. And supplements, um, again, we'll come back to that. So dry foods, I, this is um, something that I, I struggle with because not so much in the working dog, uh, lines, but certainly in the pet food lines, it's, it can be a license to print money for some of these people. I'm going to get in trouble for that. But the, anybody can put, um, you know, you go online and you can find dog food that are, people are paying a lot of money for with a beautiful picture of a, a salmon in a, um, you know, in a virgin stream in the mountain with clear blue skies and 18 plus eggs jumping through the bush and they shoot them before they've they've had a chance to, to know that they're being chased and all the rest of it. So, um, you know, they make lots of beautiful stories of, of all sorts of food, but actually the, the basic micro and macronutrient requirements um, aren't that well set out in some of them. Look at your labels. If, if they're not breaking it down really, really well, so just check the ingredient labels. It's amazing. You know, you have, they have those beautiful pictures on the front of the packet. And then on, when you get down to the nitty gritty of it, it, down to meat byproducts and um, you get what you pay for. Meat byproducts is, is not always going to give you what you need as far as protein. So these guys, uh, a lot of the, the studies that have gone into working dog nutrition is based on um, the huskies that, that do the, those big um, thousand mile races up in the Yukon. So not always comparable to us, but it's, they have similar jobs. So they're, they're athletic. They're lean and they, they need nutrients every day. So basically they run on um, about 30% um, protein and 20% fat. Um, some of those get, get higher than that. So really depends on the type of, of metabolism your dog has. You can feed that. There's a lot of hunterways that um, you struggle to keep weight off, um, in which case they wouldn't need as much of a high fat, uh, you know, those high, fat, high protein diets comparative to, to um, some of the feisty little um, heading dogs that, that are try hard to keep weight on. Um, and supplements is, is right up there. There's, I think there's a, a real 
place for, for supplements. Um, we're certainly seeing that in, in arthritis management as the dogs get, old, get uh, older and seeing some really good results from some of those. But again, they're not all created equal. There's many, many of them that don't have any scientific data behind them. They just, um, they buy themselves some gelatin capsules and they put in um, a bit of glucosamine, a bit of green lip muscle um, and some deer velvet and, and they, they think that that's gonna do the job. And I, I don't think that's entirely true. They need good solid, um, science behind them to be able to stand up and, and say that they're, they're worth their, they're worth their weight. Uh, Nick Cave from Massey has done some good work on, on some of those supplements and certainly has come across the genified some that are, um, that, that do have a significant quantifiable improvement when they're used. Uh, but again, it's what you pay for and the type of glue of green lip muscle that goes into them is not great created equal, or that's just, that's just, one example, but the, the type of supplement that goes into each of those, um, those mixes, they're not all created equal. So sometimes you could be wasting your money and sometimes you're not. So you just need to be careful about what you're buying. And I think that's it for a feeding. So has anybody got any questions there? Yes, we sure have had a couple of questions come in. What would be a couple of really good joint supplements for dogs with arthritis or joint degeneration? Um, okay, well, um, I meant to look this up beforehand. To, I was going to look up the next study and, um, and give the name of the, the one that he's, that he's done the testing on. I mean, the thing with a lot of these supplements is they haven't had any scientific studies done on them like nothing that certainly stands up um we t i tend to use um a lot of a, a drug called foresight in in my orthopedic cases and I've, i'm really happy with results from that um and again i'll I've, the green at muscle one that nick was using i would have to look up the the name for that because it just can't come to me at the moment how do you read the ingredients in a bag of dog food to find out if it's the right balance of, you know, fats and proteins and things like that. Okay, that's a hard that's that's a hard thing to to talk about in five minutes or less. Um, I think you need to use your veterinarians. Like they will, um, contrary to popular belief, uh, most veterinarians <laughs> will be objective for you, um, and certainly. You will have like a lot of those dog foods with the the bigger trade names. So Hills, Royal Cannon, You Can Do It. They're probably the fir the first three that did any work um, in animal nutrition. There's some of, some of them that are, are catching up generally because I know that there is certainly some expen expensive ones um, that people are getting online that tend to be. Uh, not dodgy, but they certainly, they don't have an awful lot of science put in behind them. And, and I do question some of their, what's in them, you know, as far as quality and, and bioavailability. So look, um, the best thing to do would be to, to have those discussions with your veterinarian. I mean, veterinarians are very good at giving information away. So that's not going to cost you, but, but help them, or let them help you go through some of that stuff. Cause it's, uh, been out long webinar all by itself so dogs that won't put on weight you put food in front of them but they won't eat it what can you do well depends on so i guess I'm, I'm assuming that those dogs are eating something so um you know possibly there's a lot of dogs that are pretty keen on on their meat and you can add you can add some fat supplements. So a lot of times those dogs that really struggle to keep weight on really just need extra calories. So we add those extra calories through things like, uh, flaxseed oils. Um, there's some good trade names, um, oils out there that you can add just on top of their actual food that they're eating. So they don't have to eat big amounts, but they're still getting increased calories. Um, some of those dogs, if they're working, super hard then you sometimes have to get into feeding them more often than once a day you could do have to be a wee bit careful as to when you do that so that you don't end up with problems with stomach problems when they're 
when they're going to work. Certainly on, on their days off to add in those extra feeds if, you, if they're hungry. Like sometimes they just won't want to gorge a whole lot. And there'll be dogs that'll leave food in their kennels. And that, that you know, that's the, the issues you come across with, with some of these animals that are hard to keep weight on. That they're just not a guts. That, you know, they've got a low food drive requirement. And they'll eat, meet their energy requirements, but not exceeded enough to put weight on. And that's when those high concentration fat supplements are, are useful. Cool, thanks. So from Ben, would I be best to try and feed them as soon as their work is complete or essentially what time of the day would be best to feed dogs? Oh, I guess you often like to let them cool down a little bit before they have a, because if they come off the hill and they're, or come off a, a big heavy day of work and they're thirsty and hungry and they gorge themselves, that can, that can be a problem. So if you give them time just to cool out a little bit after their work, then generally if you feed them around about the same time every night, then, then that's, that's perfectly fine. Cool. It's hard to get an absolute perfect on that one. So basically <laughs> you don't want to take them right up, just like um, a person. You don't go for a run. You know, you don't go for a 20K run or 10K run and come home and um, gorge yourself. You might be hungry and have a little bit of something to eat, but generally you cool down and um, once you're all sorted, then you can actually have a proper meal because your, your gut and your metabolism is all ready to, to go into eating mode rather than running, running mode. Cool. Um, okay. Is it normal for a pup to get leaner with age as they grow? Yep. Um, they go through their teenage stretchy bits just like people do. Um, I think the, the, the days of having great big fat puppies are again is something that we don't recommend anymore. <clears throat> I mean, you can't, pups coming off their mum, not usually a problem. They'll often come um, nice and, <laughs> well, not working dogs so much because they're often weaned before they leave. But, um, you know, as they grow, their energy requirements will outstrip what they're eating and they will get leggy and, and lean. And that's not a bad thing, especially in a great big dog. We used to feed um, big dogs and little dogs all the same. Now certainly try and those great big fast growing hunterways, we probably try and slow them down a little bit. So we feed them like you'll, they'll just say they have large breed, medium breed, small breed puppy diets. And the reason for that is your little tiny Jack Russells and all that sort of stuff. Well, they motor and they grow super, super fast and mature fast. And so they're not as important as these big guys that, that are, you know, they might grow till they're over 12 months of age. Um, and you don't want to grow them too fast because you can, you can get it so that your bones outstrip your ligaments and your joint growth and whatever, it, it becomes unbalanced. And you'll see some dogs, um, they'll go over on their carpuses um, so that, you know, they're, their ligaments are too tight um, and those dogs we back off on their feet a little bit. So make them, don't feed them right up. Make sure they're on a large breed diet that's lower in energy um, and grows them just that little bit extra slower. So it, it lets things develop as they should rather than, than just give them all the energy they can so that they grow too fast. If then if they're genetically prone to some of the cartilage and bone development problems, you can certainly make it worse by overfeeding them um, and certainly over-exercising them. So you need to be a wee bit careful in some of those great big fast growing leggy guys that you don't over-exercise them and you certainly don't overfeed them. Check for those, those nice shiny coats, um, that nice little bit of fat cover over their ribs. Um, but certainly they will go through periods when you think, oh my gosh, they're pretty tall and pretty skinny. But if their energy is good and their coats are nice and shiny and their energy is good, then that's perfectly fine. Cool. Yeah, I've just thought of a question that kind of came to me after discussions that we'd had previously, but also after watching Coast to Coasters on the weekend, thinking about fueling dogs over a long period of time if we're out mustering all day long um what are the benefits or what should be some of the foods that maybe we should take for our dogs if we know we're going to be out all day like we stop for smoko 
um, and lunch. Um, should we do something for our dogs as well? And if so, what should that be? Well, see, that's what I thought, um, that's something I'm pretty keen on, and I think that we don't have anywhere near enough research and development of that sort of stuff. You know, you get those guys that are on the coast to coast and that sort of thing, and they're, you know, you'll see them down in gels and all sorts of things like that. And I, and I think um, that's something we maybe need to look into for, for dogs that are doing long, high intensity work. Um, you know, they just, there's no way that they can physically um, eat, and eat enough in one meal to, to sustain that. Um, so do we have the data and, and research on that? No, we don't. Um, I think you want to be careful that they, you give them, you can't give them a snack, use um some of those really good you know high high fat high protein um biscuits and don't don't give them huge huge amounts but even a small amount is is going to make a big deal to them if they're um low in energy thank you laurie really awesome um you did a fantastic job <laughs> and uh awesome amount of knowledge that you've got all right thank you thanks very much